next thing is something that you guys have have kept asking me to do for the last two weeks since it's come out because uh you know we always do the we always do the uh law ygo Yu-Gi-Oh recaps and this one came out came out like two weeks ago and i've been busy you know with ycs bologna and all that good stuff and we haven't done it yet so we are going to watch together the 2012 Yu-Gi-Oh recap from the law ygo one of my favorite series on youtube i'm gonna i'm gonna send the link in chat as well and we need to we need to pin it i have pinned the link to the video shout outs to the law ygo as per usual uh these are great insights into the history of Yu-Gi-Oh. for me personally they are they are huge nostalgia baits because you know i was playing back then um but even if you didn't play back then you know i think it's interesting to look back at it um and how the game was back in the day and we are going to lean back and enjoy the thing for 2012 2012 uh also the year of my first uh i think my first top 2012 ycs leipzig within with windups i'm pretty sure and obviously also the year that i got to go to the world championships for the very first time because it all it all happened very fast back then i got very lucky at the european championship in 2012 uh, and made my way all the way to top four so it's a year that i think back to very very fondly Entering 2012, the Zexal era had just begun and was already starting to pick up steam. While Exceed strategies weren't viable out the gate for the era, Photon Shockwave- Okay, it starts with a banger right off the bat. Photon Shockwave is like an insanely powerful p pack. Like what's- I, I, Top of my head, Rescue Rabbit, Wind Up Rabbit, uh... What- a, there's like a, the, the, the freaking everything, man. Its release had brought the first major XC deck into the meta with Dino Rabbit, leading to the first core release of 2012, which would take that initial step and run miles with it to completely change the meta into an XC dominated space. Right, it had Dolka. Right. Order of oh, Chaos. Oh, I remember now where we left off because we watched 2011, and 2011 already had Rescue Rabbit. Red right? Rescue. No, wait, no, Rabbit was foreshadowed i don't remember exactly where we left off release date january 20th 2012 set type core set major strategies insector wind up ninja impact oh no okay no photon shockwave that's why I, I got it mixed up in my head i was like did we already watch this but like uh we haven't but it's like photon shockwave was at the end of 2011 and we start 2012 off with order of chaos okay now wait, now i'm now i'm back okay triangle format rises Order of Chaos in many ways is the full start of the Exceed dominance on the meta, as while Dino Rabbit may have been the first Exceed deck, Chaos would bring forward two major meta threats into the space to fully spark the Exceed takeover. Starting with the not as impactful archetypes, Photon would receive a couple of new notable pieces in Lizard, yeah. able to tribute itself to search for a Photon, Photon was never deck, good. The only Crusher, card I remember ever a 2K playing normal was summon Photon that swaps Thrasher, the defense if it attacks, that one and was Thrasher, good. able to special summon itself from hand if you control no monsters and can't attack if you control another monster. While Photon as a deck was still nothing with this support, Thrasher specifically would find a home in rank 4 centric decks thanks to its swarm capability Thrasher. and its typing as Warrior, making it searchable with Rhoda. Ninja received a major wave of support for the Exceed era thanks to the Element Armor Ninjas, providing level modulation, Grandmaster Hanzo, able to search either Hanzo's a ninja based. or a ninjutsu art card based on how he's summoned, Hanzo's Ibizu, based. who bounces spells and traps, Upstart Golden, who can trade a trap in hand to special summon a ninja from deck, White Dragon, a TCG exclusive that protects spells and traps from destruction, Blade Armor Ninja, a warrior locked rank 4 that can detach a material to make a ninja attack twice that turn. Number 12, Crimson Shadow Armor Ninja, a rank 5 able to detach a material on a quick effect to protect ninjas from destruction that turn. Armor Ninjutsu Art of Alchemy, able to destroy at least one other face-up ninjutsu art card to draw two. Ninjutsu Art of Super Transformation, able to send a ninja you control and a monster the way. opponent controls to the grave to special- Probably because most of these are just not relevant. Like Hanzo and Super Transformation were like fine. But most of the all the element ninjas have never seen play. The exceeds were good, but mostly in other decks. Uh, yeah, I didn't remember it being this many because so few of them were actually relevant. Summon a dragon, dinosaur, or sea serpent from deck with a lower level than the total of the monster sent. And then Jitsu Art of Duplication, a TCG exclusive duplication able to tribute a ninja day, to summon ninjas the from deck whose total level is less than or equal to the tributed ninja. 
Ninja from here would become a rogue strategy, but specifically the combination of Hanzo and Super Transformation would be a tech option for various strategies centering around dragons, dinosaurs, yeah. and sea serpents for a while after, though not super popular for now. Evol would see a couple of pieces to push the strategy forward in Evo Force, which tributes an evil tile to summon an evil Sar from deck, treating it as summoned by an evil tile effect, and Evo Tile Najasho, a TCG exclusive that summons an evil Sar from deck when tributed. While Evol would not be meta still, these two would go a long way in making the deck playable at a rogue level by giving the strategy- People did play Evol back in the day, people tried it, but it was like, uh, it was never more than like a tier 2 to tier, tier 3 deck back in the- pro probably closer to tier 3, like it never really saw any success, but it, it was like something you could mess around with. Actual swarming tools to use with their exceeds and archetype. As for the archetypes that would be meta, Insector was a series of insect monsters focused around equipping themselves to each other to level modulate and gain other effects. With Insectors all of the lower so level insectors sharing an effect to equip an insector from hand or grave to themselves once per turn. Gaining level and potentially attack and defense equal to the equipped monsters. So contrary to what you might think, even though I did bring Insector to the 2012 World Championships uh, and got third with it, I never really liked Insector. It was just, I, I, it was so strong at Worlds. We're probably going to talk about that in a bit when they get to Worlds in this video. But like, it was so strong that you just had to play it. But I, I, I didn't really love Insector that much back then. It's, looking back at it now, it's like kind of cool. But uh, I didn't like it that much back then. Usually. With Dragonfly, special summoning an Insector from deck when a card it as equipped much to as it is sent to grave. Rabbit, like, it Centipede, searching an Insector card when an equipped card is sent to grave. Hornet, able to send itself to grave while equipped to pop a card on field. Gigamantis and Giga Weevil, who both can equip themselves from hand to an Insector what, themselves. Like? Boosting I their mostly, I, in the TCG, I played mostly Windup. But for Worlds, that wasn't an option because Windup had a lot of TCG exclusives. But I played a lot of Windup. Windup is also my first ever top at YCS Leipzig. And Windup is also the deck that I qualified to Worlds with. Um, but then at Worlds, I couldn't play Windups. Attack to 2400 or Defense to 2600, respectively, with both special summoning an Insector from Grave when sent to Grave while equipped, Zek Caliber, an equip spell that boosts the monster by 800 and recurs an Insector card when sent to the Grave from the field, and Hopper, a TCG exclusive that can send itself Hopper to Grave while equipped to let the previously equipped monster attack directly that turn. But it's the only monster that can attack that turn. Insector would very quickly become meta off the back of the interactions of Dragonfly, Centipede, and Hornet. With your standard line getting you I think you the thing I didn't like about Insectors was that the deck was so freaking powerful if you drew Hornet, but if you didn't have Hornet, it was a huge issue, right? Because, like, the entire deck just falls apart if it doesn't have Hornet. They gave them Ladybug later, or, like, I don't know if Ladybug was in the same set as, as the first wave, but, like, Ladybug was kind of like a pseudo-secondary Hornet like, that was also okay, but, like, Hornet was still much better. Two level three monsters, a search you for follow-up. You got to play card trooper at Worlds? Yeah, I also got to get freaking, like, in top four at Worlds, my opponent went Heavy Storm, Card Trooper, Mill, I don't know how many Darks, but they had exactly three after and Dark Armed me. So don't mention Card Trooper in 2012 to me one more time, please. And two pops, being rather powerful for the current metagame as a board breaking combo strategy. By Card the other meta powerhouse to come from this would be Windup, who received Rat, able to change itself to defense to revive a Windup from Grave. Shark, a TCG exclusive that can special summon itself from hand when a Windup is summoned, able to raise or lower its level once per turn. Carriers and Mighty, a rank 3 able to detach a material to summon a Windup from deck. And Zen Bio, an OCG import now rank 5 that can detach type. a material to destroy two set cards once per turn. Windup, thanks primarily to Rat, Shark, and Carrier, would quickly rise into the meta as a hand-ripping combo deck thanks primarily to Windup Hunter from it was Shockwave, so toxic, man. able to tribute a monster to hand-rip once while on the field. After establishing a Hunter, you can overlay it into Zenbidey, who can detach the Hunter to summon a Rat from deck, able to then revive the Hunter, tribute off the Zenbidey to rip a card, and overlay with the Rat for <laughs> another Zenbidey so just to do it again. This was exceedingly easy to set up too, thanks to Windup Magician and Shark, who themselves could standardly set up a full combo and provide an additional rank 4 to work with. Other notable cards from the set include Trance Archfiend, able to discard a Fiend once per turn to boost itself by 500 attack, also cool. able to recur a Banished Dark when sent to Grave, being an instant slot in for Dark World, Number C39 Utopia Ray, able to overlay itself onto Utopia, being a last ditch comeback tool for rank 4 decks by boosting itself by 1500 and dropping an opponent's attack by 3000. 
but only if you had 1,000 or less life points. Number 96, Dark Mist, a 3 material rank 2 that can detach a material to permanently steal half the attack of the monster at battles, being slotted in as an option for agents to make with shine balls. Yeah. The huge revolution is over, a counter trap comparable to Starlight Road, able to negate a spell or trap that would destroy at least two cards on the field, banishing it, seeing some tech play. Tour Bus from the Underworld, a TCG exclusive that shuffles a monster from grave into deck when sent to grave from anywhere, intended to be a summon target for Tour Guide. An MX Saber Invoker, an OCG uh -oh. import rank three that can detach a material to summon a level 4 Earth Warrior or Beast Warrior from deck destroying it in the end phase. Being not used now, but eventually becoming a powerful combo enabler. If this was everything, it would already be enough to completely rock the meta to its absolute core, bringing multiple new strategies into the competitive space. But this core set was also complemented by a structure deck released two weeks later that would also introduce various oh, new power cards to the meta, although their power would not be realized for a little bit of time Is it already after. dragon time? Oh yeah, oh God. Dragons Collide. Release date, February 3rd, 2012. That's Set such a type, pog structure, structure deck. deck. Major Strategies, Chaos Dragon. Impact, Breaking a Spell from 2006. Dragons yeah, well, Collide yeah, okay. is a bit of an odd... Future Fusion was a problem in 2012. Like, uh, the, the card... Like, Light Pulsar and Dark Flare Dragon are incredibly cool cards, but Future Fusion was a freaking problem. The Structure Deck was cool... If Future Fusion didn't exi exist, it was so much. It was going to be so much cooler. But like, yeah. Structure deck in terms of release, as while it released on February third in the TCG officially, it had a bit of a staggered release in full, along with the various side sets of this particular year, leading it to releasing in the EU I always and thought Oceania this deck was so a full cool, but I never played it because it was so bricky. Well, this I resulted it at, in the like, next YCS we'll but be never talking about not being able to so use the new bricky. cards from the set due to legality dates, which is the primary reason for its staggered results. As for the deck itself, Dragons Collide would aim to take the previous Chaos strategy and meld it together with powerful dragons released over the past few years to form a new deck in Chaos Dragons, which combined the tendencies of both Chaos Brews and Aggro Dragon into a single strategy. This was thanks to their new cards here, Light Pulsar Dragon, so who has the cool. standard Chaos Summoning condition of banishing a Light and Dark, but is also able to summon itself from Grave by discarding a Light and a Dark, able to special summon a level 5 or higher Dark Dragon from Grave when sent to Grave. Dark Flare Dragon, who has the standard Chaos Summon condition and can discard a dragon to send a dragon from deck to grave to banish a card in either grave, and Eclipse Wyvern, who banishes a level 7 or higher light or dark- I never realized that Dark Flare Dragon also foolishes for cost. Because it's, you can send a dragon from hand and a dragon from deck to grave, then target a card in the grave, banish it. I never realized that. Probably because we didn't have PSCT back then. Dragon from the deck when sent to graveyard, adding it back to hand when the wyvern is banished. While Dark Flare wasn't used too much, Light Pulsar and Eclipse Wyvern would become the cornerstone of a new strategy of Chaos Dragons thanks primarily to their interactions with Red Eyes Darkness Metal Dragon, who can revive the Light Pulsar, who itself could revive the Red I mean, MD. Eclipse Wyvern is still banned, right? Yeah. It got banned during Guard Dragon format, right? Yeah. All of this was enabled by the previous spell of Future Fusion, which at this stage was we already being PSCT? abused by okay, Aggro Dragon just, thanks to its ability. Then I just haven't thought about Dark Flare Dragon in 11 years, and that's why I didn't remember it did that. But. ...to reveal five-headed dragon to dump five dragons from deck to grave, but could now dump Eclipse Wyverns to be banished for a Chaos Summon, immediately netting a search, which standardly meant you could get the entire strategy rolling off of a single card. Reprints here included Prime Material Dragon, Red MD, Dad, Chaos Sorcerer, Summoner Monk, Lila, Raiko, Book of it's Moon, base Reasoning, Monster Gate, Charge of the Light Brigade, and Call of the Haunted. YCS Guadalajara would be the first YCS of 2012, taking place on February 4th. And while the faces of the previous meta were still around to varying levels of success, the new Exceed strategies had clearly taken a majority of the top cut, centering the meta game around these three. Wind Up would take the highest slice of the three, but would only clear into the top eight overall, as the Face. three in a weird way formed a sort of rock-paper-scissors dynamic where standardly Wind Up beat Rabbit, Rabbit beat Insector, and Insector beat Wind Up. Wind Up being able to hand rip the opponent for three to four cards in the first turn is insanely powerful, especially going into cards that- I will say, Wind Up, I mean, yeah, Wind Up could hand loop, right? Wind Up definitely could hand loop, but people played like Maxis and Effect Veilers a lot. I like after, 
this is the early days, but I, I think we're going to see a lot more effect veilers in people's decks moving like in the next couple uh, thingies that they're going to show. Um, like the chance that you would actually hand loop your opponent with, um, with, with wind up wasn't actually that high. It didn't happen that often. Uh, it was... I think the best part about Wind Up was its grind game with cards like Wind Up Factory. Like Wind Up Factory was an insane card in in any sort of grindy scenario. Because Wind Up Factory says it's a continuous spell that says whenever, like when uh, once per turn when a Wind Up activates the in effect, you get to search a Wind Up from deck to hand. So it was very very often a game of you would play a grind game, assembling resources, grinding through your opponent's resources until eventually you would break through and combo them uh, and win the game, right? That was mostly what it was about. But it did, of course, have this small chance of sometimes you open Magician Shark and your opponent doesn't have a hand trap and then you just win the game, right? But like, um, yeah. <laughs> okay. But yeah, I, I think Wind Up was a pretty cool deck, even though, of course, the chance that it would hand loop you, it would, that wasn't fun, right? But like, don't operate well in the grave like Rabbit, especially when they have to go into top deck mode with a deck of six bricks in their vanillas. However, Insector can play out of the grave quite effectively since their monsters can equip pieces from grave. So the standard hand loop is not as effective against the bugs, which is why you'd see many players on Wind Up main decking cards like Fiendish Chain to stop an Insector line from starting. You may have also noticed the inclusion of Maxi into the main deck here. This is about the point where Maxi started to see more stable usage. Yeah, as true. one of the three decks in the meta, special summoned like this is true. It's like this is this format started like you know you would you would play Maxi because if your opponent goes Rabbit, you draw two cards. If your opponent goes Tour Guide, Maxi's good. Uh, if if you if you play against Wind Up, Maxi's gonna be good. Um, the thing is, Maxi starts becoming a staple here. Yet it, I, I don't, I think at this point it still wasn't like a toxic card. Uh, if you got hit with Maxi, you wouldn't lose the game. You would just like set your traps and pass. And arguably, at that time, it actually was more like Maxi was intended, right? Because it, it would only be really annoying for you if you planned on doing something super degenerate. Like if you were. If your hand did the wind up hand loop and Maxi stopped you, you know, it's probably a good thing that it did that, right? Like that is the year where Maxi started seeing a lot of play, but I don't think this is the year where it became a problem yet. I don't think we're there yet. Um because in that time frame, usually it was like, okay, my opponent activates Rescue Rabbit and they're going to get a free freaking Lagia on legs, so it's only fair that I'm going to draw two cards to combat that, right? Like that it did it didn't feel like a super unfair trade like it was it was fine in that sense right your opponent gets a powerful lag yeah you get one extra card in hand and both players were like fine with that interaction right and it's like against wind up of course like i mean it was necessary to stop the wind up hand loop for example so in that time uh i think maxi did accomplish what it was designed to do which i think is an interesting thing to look at because like from today's perspective that's like you know obviously today the card is not healthy anymore but it, there was a time where the game was so different that the card actually made sense when they made it. Like, when they made Maxi, I think in, it made sense from how the game worked back then. Like crazy, being wind up. So being able to effectively counter the hand loop on turn one was a viable tool in this metagame. Insector would make it a little farther than wind up here, making it to the top four. And similarly, it had interesting dynamics with the other two decks in the meta. Seeing as how many cards in their deck could facilitate the board-breaking combo and Zector is deck. known for, Windup is not nearly as potent of an issue when playing into it. However, Dino Rabbit still poses a threat as Zector has a difficult time playing into monster effect negation going second, which led to more monster removal in the main to out Dolka. Last of the big three, Rabbit made it all the way to second place here, facing an Insector matchup won? in the top four. Notably, main decking DD Crow here as a way to counter out the Hunter loot by banishing the one copy of Hunter out of the grave after the first Zen Mighty summon, as well as being able to counter out Insector by banishing their Hornet out of the grave. Aside from this, not much had changed in the deck's structure since the previous outing. However, none of the big three would take this event, with that honor going to Oscar Zavala on six samurai, There's similarly no main decking Max. There's no shot, man. I mean, it's not a terrible deck, but the other three are so much better. At three copies to help manage the field of the big three. 
YCS Atlanta would be held two weeks later, and in that period of time, it had become fairly clear that Dino yeah. Rabbit was probably the pick moving forward. No, as the shot. other two had Dino clear Rabbit counters sucked, going man. first and different hand traps, while Rabbit still had nothing really stopping it going first I due will to ignition never effect priority. Mind. Evol would see its first top here thanks to Najasho and Evo Evil. Force from Order of Chaos, cool. giving the deck some actual swarming potential between the two reliably accessing the rank 4 pool. Empty Jar would see a single top 16 finish, as the deck had received this multiple deck, tools man. for triggering the jars and stall this tools deck, like one day man. over the last year. Marquise Henderson would win the day on TG Stun, being a shocking upset in the top this deck is so toxic. Let me move over so you can see the entire list, man. Oh my god, this deck is so toxic. Oh god, dude. Top 8 of almost entirely Rabbit and Windup, showcasing the power of specifically Thunder King Ryo in the meta of extra deck bosses. This event would lead us into the next reprint set three days later, and though it had been done before, this set was still hotly anticipated for what it represented for the future of the game. And what is it? What is that? Raw Yellow Mega Pack. Oh, the Mega Release pack. date? February 21st, 2012. Set reprints. type, reprint set. Major strategies, hero, six samurai, macro. Impact, double dipping the reprint train. Raw Yellow Mega Pack is an odd case when it comes to reprint sets in the game's history, as it effectively was a compacted version of the previous year's Legendary Collection 2 for individual pack sales. Regardless, Raw right. Yellow did another big wave of reprints for various strategies and different rarities than before, reprinting Card Trooper, Grand Mole, Stratos, Necrogardna, Neosalius, Gallus, Miracle Fusion, Super Poly, Instant Fusion, Hero Blast, Malicious, Plasma, Sidra, Future Fusion, Mizuki, Ryo, D Fissure, Macro, D Prison, DD Survivor, Grandmaster of the Six Samurai, DD Crow, Gateway of the Six, and Double Edged Sword Technique. YCS Leap Sieg would take place four days later. Unfortunately, out of those, uh, out of all those, you wouldn't play any anything in these. <laughs> this is me. I'm in here. I'm uh, one of the two windups, which is criminal, by the way. We, we were criminally underrepresented at YCS Leipzig, but uh, I was I I made top sixteen at my that was my first YCS top ever, and I lost to I lost to Simon He in top sixteen. Later, and if there was an event to encapsulate how this format felt for the majority of the player base, this was the one. Seeing only the Triangle 3 decks make the top 16, with Steven Sluiz taking the event with Dino Rabbit, once again showcasing its dominance of the three. Shortly after Leap Sieg, the ban list would be updated on March 1st, and while it did handle a couple of sore points in the metagame, it may have also been one of the most out of touch ban lists to date, as literally nothing from the current big three I would get that. hit in any regard. Yeah. Newly banned were Glow Up Bulb, Spore, Trish That was one. crazy. The Glow Up Bulb, Spore, Trish one was insane, dude. No one was playing that shit anymore. They murdered plants. Like in literal hindsight, man. And trap dust shoot, which effectively took Sacred Plant was nice. out behind the barn trap and dust also was nice. banned probably the most annoying staple in the current meta. Newly limited were TG Striker and Agent Earth, being hits towards but that TG was a Agent, terrible I guess. Balance. It's a really weird hit set, regardless. Newly semi limited were Lumina, Marshmallow, Reborn Lumina. Tengu, E Telly, Level Limit Area B. Sheen Smoke Signal, Torrential Tribute, I guess and Ultimate un Offering, un being a wide set of hits and releases for decks of the previous metagame. Lastly, Unlimited was Call of the Haunted, wrapping a ban list that effectively just primed the meta to be even more reliant on the already powerful This triangle. did nothing other than uh, it got rid of Trap Dust Shoot, it, got us, it gave us a second Torrential, and sometimes the third call was something that Insector considered, but that was it. Like, and any, uh, everything else, irrelevant. Goal meta. This would be the precursor to the largest event in Yu-Gi-Oh! history, even to oh, this Long day, Beach. being YCS Long Beach on March 24th, with a record of 4,364 players in attendance, sparked by this being advertised as the 100th YCS, when in reality it was the 25th, but it was the 100th major event circuit tournament following the 75th. Right, they said 100th YCS, but it was they counted the Shonen Jumps, I think. JCs that happened in the GX yeah, yeah. and 5Ds eras. While the event did have a top cut of 64 players, records from this period in Yu-Gi-Oh's history are extremely notably incomplete for most events, with some not even having published deck lists, period. I mean, so this is most... still the biggest YCS to this date, right? 4,500 or whatever it was?
I think. Cases moving forward here, we'll be showing the top cut graphs that are representative of the meta rather than everything, as Long Beach is probably the best example of an incomplete data set for the entire year, with 39 of the top 64 being unknown. Looking instead at the top 16, a lot of what we've seen from the past few events held even through the ban list, with Dino Rabbit continuing to see the most success of the big three. Wind Up Beast would be a combination of stun decks in many Beast, respects man. with the Wind Up deck. Oh, I remember, I remember this. I remember trying this after the YCS, but I never liked it. But that was, that was crazy. With the Ape Fighter as well? Early to Photon Saber Tiger, who combined nicely with Horn of the Phantom Beast to get quick battle wins and damage in while also being a level 3 for exceed plays into the windup line. Piper Chaos is an odd deck that makes its first appearance in top 4 here, being primarily based on the previously discussed interaction between Mystic Piper and Kinkabinu, mixing in level 1 powerhouses like Thaler, Mystic, DD Crow. This deck is very, very based. It's just slightly underpowered for its time. I mean, it could still perform, as you can see here. But it was like, if this deck had existed just a little bit sooner, like a, like a year earlier or something like that, it would have cooked. But like, 2012 was just a little bit too late. And Mechlord Emperor Wysel, who provided synchro countering and spell negation, as well as the chaos bosses of Sorcerer and BLS. I'm pretty sure it was still Hero a two-day Hero also event. cleared into the top four here, primarily being the same game plan as before, but now with added access to Blade Armor Ninja for quick and sudden OTK pushes, a trend that would be taken to its natural conclusion shortly hereafter. In a massive upset, Michael Ballin would take the event with Dark World, that was notably crazy. adding in Malefic like, Stardust as no a way to one keep had gates up for multiple radar. turns no and Tour Guide providing access to Brawn for either rank 3 plays or to bounce and resummon Graffa. YCS Lima would follow a week later, and it would be far more standard to the expectations of the meta than how higher placements of Long Beach showed with the big three taking 14 of the top 16, including the first place slot piloted by Hector DeGaldo playing Dino Rabbit. Lastly in this block was the Shonen Jump promo for April 2012, which is also pretty important due to the fact that later this year, Shonen Jump was going fully digital, meaning that the promos they had tied to the service would instead now be mailed out directly rather than by the issue. While this doesn't sound like that big of a deal on paper, it meant that now, rather than waiting to see if the promo was worth it and then buying the issue from your local bookstore, it meant that you actually had to be subscribed to Shonen Jump in advance to get the promo. And once the distribution had ended, That's that was them. it. You couldn't go and buy more copies of the magazine to get more, you only got what was distributed. With that said, the final print promo for Shonen Jump was number 30 Acid Golem, Truly which is never technically problem, already right? in players' hands prior to the April 1st drop Do date. you know why Acid Golem was good at the time? Do you want me to tell you why we played Acid Golem sometimes? It was because it was the biggest freaking rank 3 you could make. There was no other rank 3 that was that big, and you would, like, take the drawback. You know, like you would take the drawback of like, I can't summon cause just so you can make the biggest possible, like turning tour guide into the biggest possible thing. And sometimes you would even play it like against like a skill drain deck or whatever. It would be like you're only out to deal with like a big monster uh, and so on and so forth. You know, like that was actually the reason why, why they, that, that was the intention behind Acid Golem, you know? Thanks to it showing up in some deck lists as far back as Long Beach. Being a rank 3 with 3000 attack that locks special summoning of the owner, had to detach a material each turn or burn the user, and couldn't attack if it had no materials. At this time, it would be primarily slotted in decks with reliable rank 3 access, which at this stage was practically every deck thanks to Tour Guide, yep. thanks to it being a large attacking body that was easy to summon. This would lead into the year's starter deck two weeks later, and while most starter decks at this stage were hit or miss, this one would bring a couple of new tools to the pool to spice things up nicely. Ooh, the Jin one, right. Oh, I love these Jins, man. Tem Tempo, dude. Tem Tempo, Tem -tempo Symphony. was so cool. Release date, April 13th, 2012. Set type, starter deck. Major strategies, Jin. Impact, a few new staple exceeds to the pool. Exceed Symphony would join the pool of the various 5D starter decks in that it introduced that such a couple a sick of starter. cards that would worm their- My stroke was probably the, the best out of the four, but I, I thought I, Tem Tempo was such a cool card, man. ...way into strategies throughout the rest of the year. It was and it would be really thanks good. to the Jin monsters, a series of exceeds that each have their own control-centric effects, with My Stroke protecting itself and able to flip a monster face down by detaching material, Mellow Melody able to make a Jin attack twice, 
Muzarhythm, who could double an attacking Jin's attack, and Tem Tempo, who could detach materials from an opponent's exceed. While some of these would be more valuable than others, the Jins became popular extra deck staples yeah. for a period after. Specifically, so with basically, Maze Stroke was an out to a lot of things because it's like it, it can book something and you can it protect it from destruction. Tem Tempo can steal Xyz materials, which is really good sometimes, you know, against stuff like Tem Tempo was a freaking broken answer to stuff like Zen Mains, uh, like stuff that basically had the effect to protect itself. When uh when they would be destroyed, you detach a material instead. You would just summon Tem Tempo to steal the materials, uh like Gachi Gachi, Zen Mains, My Stroke as well, um that kind of stuff, right? And then Musa Rhythm could also be three K, right? My Stroke, though each had a period of playability at different points. The only one of the that was history. Um, Reprints here irrelevant was Mel Gam, Mellow Melody, MST, but the, uh, the fourth Rota, one you didn't Utopia, play ever, pretty much. Being a light reprint wave in line with starter deck Or Utopia. Utopia was another YCS one where stealing its materials was relevant. To lose would take place the next day. And that, while many of the faces really cool were the same idea, as really the cool previous outings, the there were two decks that were creeping into the public mindset Bro. from this event specifically. The first of these was a new iteration of Hero Beat, now referred to as Bubble Beat, which trimmed the monster line down to Stratos. This deck was scary, man. The three alias and the new inclusion of three bubble man whose special summon from hand effect effectively gave an additional body to exceed summon with providing an incredibly useful tool thanks to blade armor ninja's previous release pushing 4400 damage off of a single exceed summon that also set up the grave for a miracle fusion push the deck didn't suffer in terms of consistency either thanks to e-emergency call filling the newly vacated monster slots being a monster that effectively could be set in the back row to allow for Bubble Man to summon itself. Then you'd flip it to search after the fact, which could itself search Wasn't a Bubble Stratos Man for a no, 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 not yet. Not additional yet. summons. The other big hit of a deck would be Chaos Dragons, yeah. taking the event piloted by Peter Gross, maxing out every Chaos piece it possibly could alongside the new Dragon Core, though extremely notably chose not to play Future Fusion yet. OGs will remember uh, Peter Gross as that discovery hadn't quite come into the public eye here. Instead, that discovery would happen- I want to say first ever three-time YCS champion? Probably. I don't think anyone else had three at the time. But at YCS Dallas held the same day, Billy, where Chaos maybe? Dragon similarly climbed the ranks to second place, showcasing the Twilight Engine far more than before, but would primarily be centered around Future Fusion, able to set up the deck's primary plays off the back of the one card. Nazar Sahan would take the event on Dino Rabbit, notably playing triple of both Maxi and Valor to counter Windup and Insector respectively. This, however, was also about to be a sufficient counter to Dino Rabbit as well, as 11 days later on April 25th, the TCG rules were updated, removing ignition effect priority from the right, game, matching the that changes- that was so big! Dude, who here remembers priority, man? Priority is a rule that we had for so long that made no freaking sense, man. It made no sense whatsoever. Like, I'm sorry, like, I'm an old head and it's always like, you know, people always hate when things change. They're like, oh, this new thing is like, but looking back at it, the priority rule, it made no freaking sense whatsoever. You couldn't veil the, yeah, you couldn't veil the freaking rabbit. Okay. For anyone, I mean, most people probably remember or have heard about it at some point, but for anyone who doesn't know, when I say priority, it refers to, it refers to a rule that allowed the turn player to, on, like, uh, in, in open game states, you could basically shotgun, I don't know how to phrase what the exact wording would be, but you could shotgun or, like, you can activate an ignition effect Pretty much like a quick effect, right? Like you would just like, for example, if you normal summon rescue rabbit, you don't have to wait for your opponent to like say okay to the summon. Like as as long as your opponent doesn't have like a solemn judgment, like as as soon as the summon is successful, you can go chain link one rescue rabbit effect before your opponent can uh, torrential tribute or uh, effect veil or anything like that, right? Like you basically uh, you your opponent didn't have priority to activate. On, on the summon of your monster, right? Which is basically, it was just so hard, like, just, uh, to interact with s things on summon. It made no sense, man. It made no sense. You could, someone in chat just said that, you could normal summon Rescue Rabbit, activate the effect, and then chain your own Torrential to it. To, to, and then chain resolves, Torrential 
kills the entire board, and then chain link one, rescue rabbit, summons two vanillas. You could do that. It makes no sense. Made earlier in the year to the OCG. This meant that now, turn player could not activate an ignition effect in response to the it successful no summon sense of a whatsoever. monster, which would primarily affect decks playing cards like Dad, Chaos Sorcerer, and most of all, Rescue Rabbit, yeah. allowing a window to respond to the summon first. This meant that going first, Dino Rabbit now had a counter, being Effect Veiler being used to snipe the rabbit before it could banish like, and use- This I think is one of the reasons why Effect Veiler wasn't so popular until this point. Like we saw some of some Effect Veilers mostly in side decks, uh, because Effect Veiler was only against Rabbit, you could only really Effect Veiler Tour Guide. It was good against Tour Guide, but not against anything else in the deck. Because Effect Veiler was good against Mind Up, it was good against Insector, but it sucked against Rabbit if they drew Rabbit its effect which would move to affect the deck's effect effectiveness was compared like to the monster. other big three members but even that status was about to be shaken ycs chicago took place just three days after the priority rule change and with it we'd see a shocking upset as chaos dragon rocketed to the top Bro, of the meta wind up and here, giving a man? challenge for the spot of top Come deck on. in the meta the deck had mostly shifted composition back towards the first show the only with the failures. future fusion Let's inclusion go. which was continuing to prove to be a massive advantage swing card Aaron Noel would take the event on Dino they Rabbit, the showing the deck still had legs despite the new counters Dino being available Rabbit's still in the cringe. meta. With this shakeup, Ice turned to the next core set releasing two weeks later, and while its contributions may seem light on the surface, a shift in player mindset was just on the horizon. Thank you, Cole. Appreciate that. Thank you for the three months. Ooh. Galactic Overlord. Release date, May 8th, 2012. Ooh, set Papillon. type, core set. Major strategies, Hieratic, Insector, Light Ray. Big Impact, one-off pieces that shift the meta. Galactic Overlord would be the second core set of the year, and it would take a swing for the fences with one new archetype in particular. That archetype was Hieratic, a series of high-level dragons. Hieratic was so damn cool, man. I loved Hieratics. I didn't play them very often because they weren't they were never that good outside of the, the the hieratic dragon ruler deck somewhere in 2013 i think or 14 but it was such a cool archetype special summon a normal dragon from hand deck or grave when tributed setting its attack to zero these included eset who could be normaled without tributing and copy the level of a normal dragon idea. onto all hieratic monsters that was annoying Nepthet, who could special summon itself from hand by tributing a hieratic monster able to tribute a hieratic from hand or field to pop an opponent's monster sue who had the same summon and pop effect, but for spells and traps. Tefduit, who could special summon itself if you controlled no monsters. Atom, a dragon lock rank 6 that could detach a material to summon a dragon from deck once per turn, dropping its attack and defense to zero. <laughs> Heliopolis, a rank 8 that can detach a material to tribute any number of other monsters from field or hand to pop that many cards on field. Seal of Convocation, a search spell for the archetype, and Reflection, an Omni Negate counter trap whose cost is tributing a Hieratic monster. Hieratic as its own deck would be hit or miss, primarily due to requiring one of the monsters that's able to be summoned without a tribute yeah. to start. Causing yeah, you had the deck had four relevant main deck monsters, two of which were meant to be on the field first, like Tefnuit is like Cyber Dragon, and the other one could be normal summoned without tribute. And then the other two were the ones like the enablers from hand that would tribute the other ones to summon themselves. And then you get to summon from the deck and so on and so forth. The deck to be prone to bricking if played pure. But you need However, to draw a tomb one of each, specifically would be pulled be from this archetype play. and splashed into Chaos and Dragons Tefnuit thanks to Light Pulsar being a level so. 6. Granting the deck easy access to Red MD from the deck by dropping its attack and defense to zero. Insector would see a couple of new pieces here in Ladybug, yeah. who could send itself to Grave while equipped to raise an Insector's level by up to two, and Exastack, an insect locked rank five that could detach a material to equip it. Ladybug was mainly from huge because it removed itself, the like you needed half of its attack aspect. Defense. Like you could while play not much Ladybug, on the surface, Ladybug specifically solved a massive issue with Insectors, a going first equipable monster. By using the level modulation effect, it was easy to trigger the Dragonfly and Centipede loops, which could also help to facilitate a new form of deck, being the Insector combo deck. Light Ray was the other big debut archetype here, Light being retrains so cool, of famous bosses sucked, in the man. game's history with similar summoning well, conditions to the suck. Dark they counterparts from very, Phantom very Darkness rarely, years prior. Like, However, none so of these would come overall. anywhere near the power and popularity of Dad, flopping on release. Moving on to the one-off cards, Card Card D was a monster that traded Ooh, the battle Card phase Card of your good. turn and normal summon to that draw two cards and end your turn. A popular choice for alternative win condition decks. 
Photon Strike Bouncer was a rank 6 that could detach a material to negate the effect of a monster on field Bouncer and burn the good. opponent for a thousand, being one of the first big generic rank 6s. Photon Papal Operative was a rank 4 that could detach a material to swap a defense monster to attack mode, dropping that monster's attack by 600, a solid option in the rank 4 toolbox. Number 25 Force Focus was another generic rank 6 that could negate a level 5 or higher monster's effects for the full turn, having a more niche usage than Bouncer, but handling some corner cases that the former couldn't. Gaia Dragon the Thunder Charger was a rank 7 that could overlay onto any rank 6 or 7, dealing piercing damage, primarily no, used to override a monster's inability to attack after using an effect, like a tomb. Night Beam, Don't make fun of Night Beam anymore. was a new spell trap <laughs> removal for set cards that stopped the targeted card from activating in response. Why did he say that? <laughs> filling a niche alongside the reliable MST. Lastly, number 11 Big Eye was an OCG import rank 7 that could detach a material to steal an opponent's monster once per turn. Not seeing play for now, but being the first big generic rank 7. YCS Philadelphia would take place a little over a week later, and while the meta appeared mostly unchanged Bro, on the stop surface, playing rabbit, a key development man. had taken rabbit hold. Sucked, the first man. of these Literally, was the appearance. I... Here, not even a hot take, just the truth. The only reason why Rabbit did so well is because so many people played it, man. Everyone thought that it was good. It wasn't. It was just the sheer numbers. By the sheer numbers of people that entered events with rabbit decks, it was just like some of them didn't draw the vanillas, man. But the decks sucked, man. Trust me. There's a final countdown in the top 16. While the deck itself would not stick around in the meta long term, it would set a precedent that would be iterated upon multiple times through the remainder of the year. That being that alt wincon tools had finally hit a critical mass thanks yeah. to cards like card card D and one day of peace, resulting in these decks standardly being able to take one Old game despair. after a long period of time, citing into stall tools like Golden Ladybug for going into time Golden to take Ladybug games in a magic. seemingly unfair <laughs> manner. Fang Shen would take the event on Chaos Dragons, seemingly changing very little with Galactic Overlord's release. The set wouldn't be able to sit for long as the new face in town, as five days after Philadelphia, a new first of its kind pack would be released, and it would usher in a new direction Konami would be attempting hey, to take Yu-Gi-Oh in for the foreseeable future. Oh, Battle Pack! Battle Pack Epic Dawn Release date, I May 24th, packs, 2012. Set type, Draft Pack. Major strategies, I miss various battle powerful pack. standalone cards. Impact, oh. the first foray into drafts. Epic Dawn would be a bold step for the game in terms of direction, being the first ever pack specifically built to be drafted for sealed play. This was different this was from all packs. This was such a good idea, man. I wonder why they stopped. I mean, maybe it didn't perform that well, but I guess. It, battle packs were so cool, because like you couldn't, you could never use classic Yu-Gi-Oh packs for drafting because there's so much archetype stuff going on that you can't do in drafting. Uh, and then they made a pack specifically for drafting and it was so fun, man. That came before it. As anyone who's ever played in a sneak peek event can attest, Yu-Gi-Oh's packs are not conductive to a sealed play environment in the slightest. Yeah. While this was a revolutionary step, this did mean that for the most part, the pack held nothing new to bring to the table. Only reprints of a couple of noteworthy cards like Gores, Tragodia, Adrius, Forbidden Chalice and Lance, Fiendish Chain. I guess they didn't put good enough reprints in it so that not enough people were interested in it. Like maybe you maybe you need to, if you want to make such a set work, you need to also add some value to it. Because they I think they designed it just based off of how can we get the best possible draft experience possible uh, without thinking about like reprint value you know like they they, they needed to throw like some because there's a lot of good cards that you can reprint in the i mean i guess they did put tour guide in it though like tour guide was huge but i guess that wasn't enough i don't know zephyros i mean easily... this wasn't the last battle pack so maybe this one was fine maybe this one did well and that's why they made more the most noteworthy tour guide being her first reprint the rarities but were not exactly shit. easy access the, due to the, the black set rares size. and the star Falls. more impactful uh. was the weekly shonen jump alpha promo that oh, was no. mailed out oh, around no. this time whose oh, legalization no. date was a week later on may 30th no. being number 16 Shockmaster, oh. a three material rank four that could by detaching a material lock the activation of spells traps or monster effects until the end of the opponent's next turn 
This was unquestionably and insanely powerful, recognized immediately as a threat, and would find its way into any strategy with reliable access to a rank 4 line. Specifically in the case of windups, as they already had the most reliable way into multiple uh... level 4s to use thanks to Magician, but wouldn't be played for some time after release due to the windup loop still being the most reliably powerful version of the deck. The European WCQ would follow this a week later, and for the most part, the meta- oh, this one, we didn't have Shockmaster yet. We didn't have Shockmaster yet, yeah. But this is where finally Windup reigned supreme in Europe. This is where finally we understood, and I was also part of this one. I was part of the 10 Windups, 10 proud Windup representers. Finally, people realized it was the best deck was what was expected, with the big three in Chaos Dragon taking the majority of representation. Watts would see a top here, primarily building <laughs> itself as a stun and chip down deck, with okay. Watt Hopper providing access to the Watt Lock and everything else being either a stall tool or direct attack chip damage to win the game slowly. Notably, Card Card D makes an appearance yet again as a stall strategy tool, which would only grow from here. Stefano Mamoli would take the event with Windup, integrating a couple of the newer Jin Exceeds into his lineups, but aside from that being fairly standard. This event would kick off the WCQ circuit for the year, which would pick up quickly, but would first be interrupted by this year's swing at the yearly reprint set with a fun new twist. Ooh, Hidden Arsenal, what is that, 3? What is that reprint? Gold Series oh, Gold Haunted series, Mine. Okay. Release date, June 7th, right, 2012. Set type, reprint set. Major strategies, staples of the last year. Impact, a unique rarity, only of its kind. Haunted Mine is an interesting experiment in the long line of Gold Series packs, as it was to this Which one? Is this already... Are Gold Rares already ugly at this point? Because, like, the very old Gold Rares are fine. Is this where they start being ugly? Hey, the only time we've seen the unique okay. rarity of ghost gold rares oh, the being gold reserved ghost. for the one card right. of each super I didn't type. like these that much, but they're like, they're not ugly, but I don't, I'm not a huge fan of them. Like with the exception of exceeds, being interesting in their selections. The cards printed in ghost gold here included Blue Eyes, Gores, Herald of Perfection, Naturia Barkeon, MST, and Solemn Joke. It's a shame that they don't show them, but it's like the reason I didn't like them was because I uh I I didn't like that like the, the picture was like super silvery white and then the border was gold, which I don't think I didn't think it fit. I didn't think it fit that it had two different like so, such dominant colors on the same thing. That's why I didn't like them with some being staples but other being downright odd compared to what could have taken their slot, specifically in the case of Barkeon. Other notable reprints from this year's gold series were Fabled Grimrow, Master Hyperion, yeah, Graffa, Bryonic, Naturia Beast, year. Formula Synchron, Beredo, it's got some Utopia, stuff in it, but Dark like, Hole, and Starlight Road, super meta being relevant. more meta-relevant than last year's but still being a bit yeah. light on the reprints expected of it. The Oceania WCQ would take place a week later on June 14th, and a point of note, the coverage of these events is almost non-existent outside of Konami's official coverage, which was not done for this particular event. So while we do have records of winners and some top cut compositions, we do not have deck lists for many of these. Oliver Parle would win the event on Chaos Dragon, being a fairly standard build oh, right. for I remember, I remember Oliver, and the other one was Jono, I think. I played against Oliver at Worlds, I'm pretty sure. He played Heroes at Worlds deck at this stage, but aside from that, we know literally nothing about this particular WCQ. The Central America WCQ would be held the same weekend, and while we know the top cut composition, we once again are missing most deck lists for this event. Alvaro Gonzalez would take the event with Six Samurai, interestingly playing a copy of Sheen Squire in the main as a way to provide battle protection for the various Six Samurai pieces, and Zanji to remove specific threats. Ironically, Six Samurai was about to get more support in the next release, but whether that support would be considered good is not really up for debate. Oh yeah, that's so bad. That guy's so that guy's bad, bad. Thank God though, no one asked Samurai for good Samurai Warlords. support. Release date, June 21st, 2012. Set type, structure deck. Major strategies, Six Samurai. No one Impact, wanted. a single worthless new card. No one Samurai wanted Samurai Warlords support. is a bit of an anomaly when it comes to structure decks, as it's actually a TCG exclusive structure deck. It was which a became horrible apparent structure deck. When yeah. you realize it only brought a single new card for Six Samurai strategies, being Shadow of the Six Samurai Sheen, a Six Samurai locked rank 4 that could detach a material to make a Six Samurai monster's original attack 2000 until the end of the turn. So Why? Bad. This is a serious question. Why? 
Shadow did absolutely <laughs> nothing for the deck in the slightest, with the structure deck itself being primarily just a series of reprints for Six Samurai, although most of the included cards were either already reprinted in Legendary Collection 2 and Raw Yellow Mega Packs. This might just be the worst structure deck they ever made, unironically. It was just like reprints of cards that already had reprints and weren't expensive one new card that completely sucked like literally no one needed that structure deck at the or time. were low rarity to begin with reprints included grandmaster kizan nishi kageki elder useless, dark useless, hole useless, rota useless, united useless, gateway useless, smoke signal useless, dojo double-edged useless, sword useless. technique and fiendish chain being all, all around right. unimpactful the South American WCQ was held the next day, and we'd see a fairly standard spread yet again, with a couple of odd decks breaking into the top 32 like Final Countdown, Machina Gadget, Black Wings, and Herald Agents. But unfortunately, we have absolutely no deck list from this event pulling these strategies from Konami's coverage of the event. Marco Oviedo would win the event with Wind Up, but his list was never made publicly available for us to analyze here. The North American WCQ was held a week later, and Dino Rabbit and Wind Up would affect- Wind Up just won everything, man. Rabbit just didn't get, didn't get shit during WCQ season. Effectively edge out the entire competition, with Wind Up taking the event piloted by Tyler Tabman, playing a mostly the standard- The true Giga Chads just knew what's up. The Giga Chads, they just knew what's up. They knew it was Wind Up all along. They all knew it was Wind Up list at this stage but notably played instant fusion for access to both only the two three and five lines rabbit. to help with consistency this would be the last wcq event before worlds but between now and then there were a couple of set releases that would break up the pace of the meta just slightly with a mostly unimpactful set release that's another hidden arsenal four hidden five? arsenal six, six already Omega exceed release date July 24th, I guess Phoenix is like set type, relevant deck somewhat. building set. Five Major years strategies, later. <laughs> dual terminal, gen 2, wave 2. Impact, more useful pieces than last time. Hidden Arsenal 6, while being better than 5 before it, still brought very little to the game as a whole, as 5 was such a low bar that even two pieces of generically good support would have done the trick. Out of the six archetypes, the only one that didn't receive any playable cards here was Steel Swarm, seeing more subpar tribute engine so pieces. Bad, Laval finally got their play starter they needed in Volcano Handmaiden, who can send a Laval from deck to grave when sent to grave with another Laval already in grave, meaning you can send all copies of Handmaiden to grave off of her effect before bending another Laval. While this seems unimpressive on the surface, Handmaiden has 200 defense, meaning that by doing this, you could set up a massive rekindling play for three level uh, one tuners, never, finding never usage in some Quasar builds. Was... Vylon would right. receive mostly standard, unimpressive pieces, but they also received Desigma, a three material rank four that could detach a material Sigma. to equip an opponent's monsters to itself, gaining a catastrophe like effect when battling monsters of that attribute, seeing some play in rank four decks. Kishki would receive fours. Vision, the ritual monster search companion to Shadow and Gust Kraken, a level six ritual that shuffles a card from the opponent's hand into the deck. Okay, on those were actually side. like that good second cards. one probably set off some red flags immediately. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, yeah. yes, a loop was discovered with yeah. the monster, Hieratic but it wouldn't be available stuff. for the TCG until 2013, and even then, the loop would be hit far prior to it becoming an issue. Gusto would receive a new rank two in Phoenix, who could detach a material to make itself able to attack twice that turn, seeing play as a staple rank two boss. Lastly, Gem Knight received probably the most basic playable card they could have in Gem Knight Pearl. A it rank was playable because it was just bigger than Utopia. Like some people played it. Some decks played it because it was bigger than Utopia. With 2600 attack Literal and no vanilla effect, exceed. Seeing play as the largest rank four body could, in the game for You know why it was actually relevant? It's because it couldn't be Fiendish Chained. King over threats. A couple of weeks later on August 10th, like that the first was actually, wave of this year's uh, collectible actually playable because like if you're a bringing a waves of new promo reprints it. to the masses with reprints of the Volsar Dolka, Gen X Neutron, Scrap Dragon, Wind Up Zen Mains, Wind Up Rabbit, Evolzar Logia, and an Those early introduction to Heroic talking. Champion Excalibur, the cover card of the next core set due out later that month. That same weekend, oh. the 2012 World... That's me. Somewhere here. There I am. 
multiple championships would take place, and with the top 8 showcase, a massive shift would appear to have taken place, but clarification is absolutely critical here. Yeah. With the World Championships, the OCG and TCG card pool has to be consolidated to ensure fairness across the board, meaning any cards that are currently OCG or TCG exclusive are banned for this event. Because yeah, so basically, no wind-up rabbit, no wind-up, I think, shark or fact, no, I think shark, no shark, no wind-up rabbit, no tour guide. Uh, so basically, the only playable deck was Insector, pretty much. <laughs> Jarrell Winston is a freaking uh, is the freaking legend for bringing Exodia to this event and topping with it. Because of by this, the way. Tour Guide from the Underworld was banned for this one event, as it was a TCG exclusive at the time, which put both Windup and Dino Rabbit at a severe handicap as Windup lost its easiest rank 3 enabler for the loop startup, and Dino Rabbit lost access to Levier for bringing back the Rabbit, leaving Insector as the only unaffected deck of the big three. Another extremely interesting sighting here was Exodia, piloted by Jarrell Pro Winston, making it all the way into top this 8 of Worlds here, thanks to all of the various stall and draw this tools from man. across it the plays years. plays gift card to give your opponents life points to draw more cards with hope for escape, man. Holy. So basically, the idea is just you keep skipping your opponent's battle phases with like Swift Scareclaw, Scarecrow, Threatening Roar of a Boku, One Day of Peace, right? Keep not letting your opponent kill you. Draw cards with Reckless Greed, Jar of Greed, Yada, Hope for Escape, and Accumulated Fortune until you have the freaking thing in your hand. So like a stall Exodia deck, pretty much. With Hope for Escape specifically being extremely powerful, as standardly, after you've resolved your upstarts, gift cards, and taken a couple of hits, you could potentially draw 6-8 to eight cards off of a resolved Hope, giving the deck an insane amount of burst draw power we hadn't seen before. Saito Akikazu of Japan would take the- This is him, man. This is the dude. This is the Heavy Storm. This is the Card Trooper, and this is the Dark Arm that killed me, man event with Insector. It's Notably, fine, I not didn't deserve to win this world championship anyways. I was kind of there randomly. Like, it was, like, I wasn't bad at the time. I wasn't bad at the time, but they, I also wasn't, like, I wasn't that good, right? I, was, I just got very lucky at Euros. Uh, and then I, at Worlds, it was just, like, Insector, Mirror Match, Fiesta, and all that. But, like, uh, yeah, it was, it was fine looking back. It was, this was the year and this was the event that really sparked my, my love for comp competitive Yu-Gi-Oh! Like, after I made it to Worlds, I never missed a European YCS in 11 years now. Like, that was the, that was the event that, that, that sparked it for me, right? Because I got, I feel like it was because I got so close but didn't get there quite playing the standard one of Zek Caliber in his list and citing really eternal rest to counter out the mirror match, claiming this year's title of world champion. This would lead into the next core set releasing two weeks later, and it would be a sort of catalyst into player thinking, as the pack's color was green. Uh-oh. Oh god. Return of the Duelist. Release date, August 24th, 2012. Set type, core set. Major Strategies, Prophecy, Madolce, Gyrgia. Uh -oh. Impact, a slow burn reboot to the meta. Return of the Duelist would be the arguable start of the green pack equals broken debate, <laughs> as while it may not have appeared to be on the first release, in retrospect, Return would introduce three different archetypes that would go on to define the <laughs> metagame in some shape or form for the next few years. The first of these would be Prophecy, which is technically two intertwined archetypes, being Prophecy, a series of spellcasters centered around chaining various spells together for massive effect, and the Spellbooks, a series of spell cards that each provide some kind of benefit to spellcasters. This first wave included Spellbook Magician, the one card that is a member of both archetypes, able to search a spell- I do think outside of Spellbook of Judgment, which is a card that I hated back then, uh, Spellbooks was really, really cool, and a lot of people don't know, but, like, Spellbook actually was very playable for a long time before, before, um, before Judgment came out. Like, there was a period where Spellbook was, was able to compete, uh, be before it got, thing. it was a very, very grindy deck, um, and it wasn't tier one, but it was very playable. It would, like, aim, aim to outgrind the opponent with, like, uh, Spellbook Tower and Spellbook of Fate every turn and all that, and like a little bit of High Priestess, a little bit of Spellbook of Power attacking over your stuff. 
it was a super super grindy deck um i never played it myself actually but i played against it at a couple of tournaments um it was during mermail format which i guess is towards the end of this year um but yeah book spell card on normal summon temperance who contribute itself the turn you use a spell book spell to search for a level five or higher light or dark spellcaster from deck high priestess able to special summon herself from hand by revealing three spell books in hand able to banish one from hand or grave to pop a card on field secrets able to search a spell book card which could include spell book magician power able to boost a spellcaster by a thousand attack and search a spell book i always found it kind of funny how all the spellbook artworks are all so lazy because they are all the same template but sometimes they are just mirrored and slightly different coloring and patterns on the thing but it's all the same artwork it's all the same like you see that it's like if you give someone the coloring book with that thingy on it and they just color it differently and all of that is a different artwork it's just like a coloring coloring book that's slightly different uh, colored, you know? If it destroyed a monster in battle that turn, life, which banishes a spellcaster spell from grave and reveals a spellbook in hand to revive a spellcaster, wisdom, which makes a spellcaster immune to either spells Maybe or traps. not all of them. <laughs> I take it back. It's only some of them. That turn. And Crescent, a TCG exclusive that can reveal three different spellbooks in deck to have the opponent add one at random to your hand, but only if you have no spellbooks in grave. Prophecy would fail to break into the meta initially, <laughs> but a baseline all. for a powerful resource loop was present with this first wave. Already able to guarantee at least two searches thanks to secrets. I guess it's only spell. It's maybe it's only power and secrets, but I okay. That makes it even more funny though. If it's like all of them are different, but these two are, have the same exact template but flipped. And Blue Boy. Madolce was a series of earth monsters that all had effects to shuffle themselves back into deck when destroyed. With Mufule summoning another Madolce from hand on normal summon. Magellene searching a Madolce on normal summon, Pudding Cess gaining 800 attack and defense while there are no monsters in grave, able to pop a card on field after it battles a monster, and Chateau, a field spell that shuffles all Madolces from grave back into deck on activation, boosts Madolces by 500 attack and defense, and made all Madolces shuffle back effects instead add back to your hand. While promising, Madolce at this stage just poised itself as an infinite conga line of decently powerful monsters, with the hardest part of the deck being that monsters used for exceed material and then being sent to grave would clog their no monsters in grave game plan, causing the deck to fall flat for now. It was but a the pieces awkward. for something were Madolce. there. Gearkia was the last of the three new big archetypes, oh, no, a series of level three and four earth machines tailored for exceed spam. These included Accelerator, who could special summon itself from hand if you controlled a Girgia, recurring a Girgia when sent from field to grave, Armor, who searches a Girgia on flip and could flip itself- <laughs> The artwork on these guys is so wonky, I love it, but I hated the deck. ...face down once per turn, Arsenal, who contributed itself to special summon a Girgia from deck, and Gear Giga Dex, a machine locked rank 4 that could detach a material to search for a Actually, level Actually, I don't think I hated the deck, I just hated that when I was playing Hat in 2014. And they set freaking Girgi armor, you lost the game. Maybe it's just my my uh my frustration from 2014 playing against Girgi. I don't actually have an issue with the deck because it was never like that problematic. It was just when you played against Girgi with hat and they set armor, you you left. And it wasn't even like uh you immediately lost, it was like a slow death flip armor every turn, man. You can't out it. Uh you die like 30 minutes later kind of or thing or machine once per turn able to special summon a <laughs> level three or lower gear gear from grave when it leaves the field gear gear would see the most short-term success of these That's three why. finding homes in all manner of earth machine strategies like machina gadget and karakuri being a neat fit especially with their exceed synergizing with all of these well on to the one-offs Atlantean Attack Squad was a slightly too early piece of support for an upcoming release, able to boost itself by 800 attack if you controlled a fish, sea serpent, or aqua monster, instantly becoming the new go-to target for D.Va. Grant Soil the Elemental Lord was a new boss for Earth strategies, able to special summon itself if you had exactly 5 Earth monsters in Grave, able to revive a monster in either Grave on Summon, and skip the battle phase of your next turn when it left the field. This card in particular would be a bit of a contentious point as we move into the next few YCSs, which we'll cover soon, where Arfthal could search a level 1 monster from your deck, taking 2000 if you did not normal summon it that turn, being useful as a generic search for a level 1 starter in the future, but for now finding a home in Piper Chaos. 
Lastly, Soul Drain was a new Skill Drain-esque uh -oh. card that locked the activation of Grave and Banished effects, seeing side deck uh -oh. play as a counter for various strategies. Three days later, the next Weekly Shonen Jump Alpha promo would be legalized for use, being the final of the three Egyptian god cards, oh, Slifer. Slifer the Sky Dragon, completing the that trifecta and being arguably an alternative for decks already teching in a copy of Obelisk, able to snipe any monster with 2,000 or less attack that's summoned. I mean, Four days after I mean, this... I, you said it was an alternative. I, have, I don't remember seeing that card on the field in a competitive Yu-Gi-Oh game ever. On September 1st, the ban list would be updated yet again to affect a shift in the meta dominated by the same Next decks from- in Obelisk? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Not at this time, I don't think, but there was- in Dragon Ruler, you could play Obelisk. People did. Months on end at this point. Newly banned were Prionic and Future Fusion, with the former being oh a generic- Oh my god, I was so happy when they banned Future Fusion. Synchro that's been played since release, and the latter being an integral god piece damn. of Chaos Dragons, being the piece that pushed the deck over the edge of power that made it so prevalent in the meta. Limits were Chaos Sorcerer and Red Eyes Darkness Metal Dragon, hits to Chaos Dragons, Evagishki Gust Kraken, a preemptive hit to the loop deck, Insector Dragonfly and Hornet, massive hits to the oh, world winning strategy, they murdered Insectors, Wind Up Carriers and Mighty, a major hit to the power of the Wind yeah. Up Hand Loop, Ultimate Offering, a hit to the Exceed Spam capabilities of Gadgets, and Spore and Tsukiyomi, returning from the band section. Newly semi-limited were Rescue Rabbit and Tour Guide, both hits to Dino Rabbit. They did as as non-impactful as the previous ban list was. This one was pretty damn huge. Even though I will say Rabbit still got off kind of easy with double Rabbit, double Tour Guide. Like Wind Up and Insector definitely were hit harder than Rabbit. It, with tour guide being a hit to most decks in the meta a hero lives an e emergency call hits to the hero beat variants specifically bubble beat heretic seal of convocation a hit to heretic which seemed odd since the deck had yet to top a major event pot of duality a Genus hit to the generic to consistency card and Kalut, debris dragon agent earth reasoning and mirror force all returning from limited lastly unlimited here were necrogardna marshmallow destiny draw e Telly, level limit area b swords are revealing light i remember people freaking out about destiny draw and teleport on limits because they were still like uh you know they got flashbacks to to teledad format but you know it was it, it it was just fine and magic cylinder being a wave of cleanup for the ban list the results from the ycs held the same day would show how these changes affected the meta being ycs toronto and the primary change would be Wind the... Up was still very fine with one Zen Mighty. You just couldn't do the hand loop anymore, but you could still shock master people. Like it was basically you would just shift from hand loop wind up to shock master wind up. So that why that's why wind up was fine. Insector got heavily hit. Rabbit got hit in consistency a lot, but like wind up probably even though I just said they they hurt Rabbit the least out of the, the three, like I think they intended that hit to be bigger to wind up than it actually was. Um, but yeah, wind up because of Shockmaster was just fine. Razure of both Chaos Dragons and Insector from the meta at large, but a few new faces would pop up here to fill the void. Ooh, is this the first the of these Jeff was Jones Machina Geerkia, making it all the way to top four on its first outing, showcasing the raw power of being able to search your entire deck off of a rank four and playing a very defensive back row line to back it up. The second, and probably most controversial of this lineup, was Jeff Jones's Grand Soil Psychics, yeah. which made it all the way to second place here, and most historians still have no clue how. The deck is full <laughs> of easy access yeah. emergency. I tried this deck after this YCS, and I also didn't really get it. Like, it, it must have been an issue of, like, people had no idea what he was doing. It wasn't that good of a deck. See teleport lines to access synchro pushes, with Serene Psychic Witch in particular holding a powerful place as a floater that sets up the following turn's main play line safely by banishing the target you're floating into until the next turn. What makes it all more interesting is that every psychic in this list was an earth monster, meaning that the new boss of Grand Soil is fairly simple to set up, with Miracle Synchro Fusion providing a late game push into Ultimate Axon Kicker for both raw power and grave manipulation for Grand Soil setups. While this deck would top again after this, it was an anomaly that very few truly understand, and it was very much a top from the player, not the yeah, deck, probably. baiting so many players that format into playing what was effectively a subpar deck for the metagame. This would be further shown by the winning deck of Wind Up, piloted by Joshua Graham, who notably adjusted his list following the carrier limit to be instead focused on the new boss of Wind Ups, Shockmaster. 
As it turns out, Shockmaster was unquestionably the best thing you could be doing this format, yeah. as almost every deck folds to calling monster effects and passing, stunning any and all response lines from your opponent, causing windups to surge in popularity following this outing. Joshua would also be the first recipient of the new YCS prize card, Digvorzok, the King of Heavy Industry, retiring so the previous bad. Blood Mephist. YCS Guatemala would be held a week later, and while we'd see more diversity in the top cut here, Windup had comfortably taken its spot on the throne as the top deck here once again. Unfortunately, this is another event where we do not have many deck lists for the top cut, relying on Konami coverage to show what the top cut was even comprised of. Angel Flores would take the tournament here with Hero Beat, notably including Card Card D into his list and backing off of the Bubble Beat trend with the semi-limiting of the primary hero spells, pivoting back to Gemini Spark builds that came before. YCS Sheffield would be held the same day, but this particular event is weird to discuss compared they to literally every Insector. other event they, this they, year. They murdered Insector of in pretty harshly. Probably rumor at the time was that it was because Insector was obviously so much more successful at Worlds than the other decks, right? Like, uh, no one played Windup at Worlds, and uh, for reasons, of course. And then uh, Rabbit didn't do anything at the regular world championships. Rabbit won the, the Dragon Duel World Championship that year. Uh, but it was, I, that was the rumor was like, because Insector was so, so prevalent at Worlds, uh, that's why they murdered it the hardest out of the three. Entering the tournament with a deck like normal, every player was given 50 random cards from Battle Pack Epic Dawn to build their 30 card decks, meaning that the event was gonna come down to deck building and raw player skill. Peter Gross would take the inaugural draft YCS. Was, that was, setting the bro, I lost top eight of that YCS because I misplayed so bad. I don't want to talk about it. The bar for future sealed events by beating Rodrigo Tagores, another large name. Oh, no, in the not scene, this one, actually. Not, not yet. That YCS Indianapolis one. would take place two weeks later, and with it, we'd see both. That was the first one uh, that, that, Peter, that Peter won. Uh, I, I was talking about the next one, which was YCS Bristles. I think that was 2013. Chaos Dragons and Insectors peek their heads back into the meta with top cut appearances, with Chaos Dragons even taking the third largest portion of the top cut behind Girgia. Going into the list we have access to, Chaos Dragons had pivoted back to using Dark Flare at its maximum three copies to provide more reliable Chaos pushes, with eliminating a Sorcerer in addition to a full reliance on the Light Sworn core of Triple Lila, Raiko, Recharge, and one Charge of the Light Brigade. Another interesting point of note here here is Night Assailant, being an additional okay. fiend target to have in the deck now that Tour Guide was semi-limited, which would be a hotly debated point moving forward. Insector would make top 8 here thanks to a pivot back towards the combo style of Insector, yeah. with Card Trooper able to potentially set up the grave with pieces like- It's interesting that they didn't even play the Tour Guide to fetch the Sangan, they played Tomato to fetch the Sangan, which is probably a very odd decision. Hornet and Ladybug, while upping copies of Zekcalibur to recur Dragonfly once it had been used. Yeah. Hieratic would make it to top four here, notably playing not only Card Card D to Good facilitate God. deeper draws to offset the bricks, but also Birdman to facilitate potential synchro plays into Stardust and Scrap Dragon, maxing out copies of a Tomb and Gaia Dragon to push massive board swarming. Junior Dorson would take the event on Six Samurai. The amount of events where we just look at some random top cut breakdown and it's like a million rabbit or a million Tengu plant or a million whatever, and every time they they cut to a freaking six samurai winning the event, man. What the hell is wrong with people, man? Literally, the last three recaps or some shit like that is always like, ah, oh, yes, there was a 99.9% .9 non-six samurai in top cut. And then they cut to like the one dude in the entire country that plays six samurai. Ah, this guy wins the event. What the hell, man? Stop playing six samurai. From earlier this year by playing a copy of Zanji as well as a copy <laughs> of Iroh to handle corner cases with Blade Armor Ninja and Heroic Champion Excalibur both being solid extra deck inclusions here, to be made with key zones that are constantly being spammed out thanks to Gateway. Following this YCS would be another major reprint set just a week later, and it would bring something interesting to the table that would change a couple of deck positions in the upcoming meta with its inclusion. Legendary Collection 3 Yugi's World. Release date, September 27th, 2012. Set type, reprint set. Major strategies, Diamera staples. Impact, 
one new card for stun strategies. Ooh, Yugi's World was the third oh, and no, probably uh, most interesting of the legendary right, collections right, 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 so right, right, right. far. As while its reprints weren't really meta relevant, it was a massive boon to the popularity of retro formats by reprinting various DM era staples that were currently banned in high rarity. Reprints here included BLS, The Gadgets, Gores, Dark Hole, Raigeki, Monster Reborn, Pot of Greed, Card Destruction, Heavy Storm, MST, Graceful Charity, Brain Control, Mirror Force, Toon Table of Contents, Sangan, Morphing Jar, Change of Heart, Harvey's Feather Duster, Solemn Judgment, Sinister Serpent, Mirage of Nightmare, Bro is reading Imperial the entire Order, set list. Torrential, Bottomless, The Gravekeeper Core, Dark Greffer, Book of Moon, and Exodia. It did also bring one more new card to the game, which itself is an odd piece of Yu-Gi-Oh! history in and of itself, as it represents a major filler arc in the anime following the end of Battle City. The Seal of Orichalcos could, in exchange for locking special summons from the extra deck and destroying all special summoned monsters on activation, boost your monsters by 500 attack, protect itself from destruction, and prevent your weakest monster from being attacked while you have two or more monsters. I remember people playing this in stun, because it would make, like, all your shits 500 more, uh, and, like, it, it wasn't actually that good, though, I believe, right? Like, it, it, I don't think it was actually a good card for stun. Like, people would play it, but I don't... I doubt that it was actually good to play. Even if you were playing stun, you could have probably gotten away with like other, like it was probably going to be better to play without it, but you know, some Sound. it was a field spell to get the malefics onto your board. Yeah, fair. Well, it sounds like a lot of drawbacks for a card with minimal upsides, or Calcos would find a home in stun strategies, as boosting your floodgate monsters like Fossil Dina and Ryo yeah. proved to be yeah. exceedingly useful while also giving a field spell that keeps itself active for your malefic monsters, negating the need for malefic Stardust's effect and making malefic Can't Cyber you get end rid of more Ibli valuable. With this? Well, yeah, you can get rid of Ibli with it, but the thing locks you out of the extra deck, so what the hell are you getting rid of Ibli for? This wouldn't be the last set release of this <laughs> block, as two weeks later, the next structure deck would release, and while its contents wouldn't be meta-warping immediately, it would quickly rise into its position as part of the next mega meta threat. Ooh. Realm of the Sea My Emperor. Love. Release date, October 11th, 2012. Set type, Structure Deck. Atlantean, Major Strategies, my love. Atlantean. Impact, half of the next meta threat. Realm of the Sea Emperor is a bit of an interesting case, as the Structure Deck would bring the primary wave of support for the archetype of Atlantean, but it wouldn't do much on its own for the time being. The primary pieces here being Dragoons, who searched a Sea Serpent if sent to Grave to activate a Water Monster effect, Heavy Infantry, who pops a face-up card if sent, and Marksman, who pops a face-down card if sent. All three of these being able to trigger off of being sent to activate a water monster effect would lay now the groundwork for an archetype coming happy. in the next core set, but we'll get to that soon give enough. Me my Notable mermails. reprints here include a Deep Sea Diva, no, Spine don't Gilman, tell me about the Snowman give me Eater, the Terraforming, Dark Hole, and Torrential Tribute, being notably lighter compared to previous structure decks. In addition to this, the last weekly Shonen Jump Alpha promo would be legalized here, being Super Dreadnought Rail Cannon Gustav Max, a rank 10 that Give can detach a material to burn for 2000, being exceptionally powerful, but the one strategy that could reliably make it, dragons, just had their primary weight into it limited, being red MD, so for now Gustav Max would be a sidelined card, but would have the occasional pop up when a level 10 deck needed that last push forward. YCS Providence would take place a week later, and with it we'd see an odd shift in the meta with agents oh, suddenly resurging breakdown man, 5 agent, 5 wind up, 3 gadgets, 2 Gadget, two Chaos Dragon, two Karakuri Gear Gear. Okay, that's base deck. Chaos Zombie, Dino Rabbit, Fish OTK, hella base. Glad Beast, <laughs> Glad Beast still, bro. Get over it. Gravekeeper, Lancer Frogs, Monster Mash, Zombie Monarch. That's a, okay. a major way. This is the kind of form. This is the kind of meta breakdown you go, used to get back in the day after a huge ban list. Everyone just goes back. Like literally, a big ban list throws everyone back like three years. They literally go crazy and dig out the freaking Glad Beasts again. 
With Agent Earth being semi-limited on the last band list, the deck had a more reliable way to access Christia lines yet again, bringing them back in as the best deck in the game to utilize both Christia and Herald of the Orange Light. Monster Mash made another appearance in Top Cut here, once again utilizing Gallus and Birdman to swarm the board, but that this time sick. also using new tools like Ghost Ship, Cyber L Tannin, and Light Ray Sorcerer to modulate Light Monster Counts in Gray for big power pushes. Lancer Frogs would be a new evolution of the previous Frog Monarch, <laughs> utilizing Sea Lancer man. with Ronin Toten to make large power pushes in addition to copies of Obelisk the Tormentor showing up as a frog end box. <laughs> Fish OTK saw a bit of reinvention here with Thriller Rapka and Shark Stickers being the targets of choice this time, giving access to your rank 3 pool to OTK the opponent with large power pushes like Kosilacanth, Giga Brilliant, and Acid Golem. Chaos Zombie would make it all the way to top 4 here, being a bit of a surprise as most of the big pieces for the deck were still hit heavily, but with 3 Call of the Haunted, Grave Revival is an easy thing to accomplish. Chris LeBlanc would win the event with Karakuri Girgia, showcasing Girgia's flexibility to merge itself with any other Earth Machine core, as Accelerator and Birdman can effectively make an entire board of Karakuris thanks to Accelerator's summon not being once per turn. Following a week later would be the second wave of the 2012 Collectible Tens, bringing yet another reprint promo wave, this time including Ninja Grandmaster Hanzo, Heliopolis, Maxi, Tour Guide, Shockmaster, Rescue Rabbit, and Levier notably making Shockmaster legal to play in the EU now. With that said, right, there was only we one got Shockmaster so much later. I remember now. That release left for the year, and to say a shakeup was coming would absolutely be an understatement, as its release was about to rock the format to its Give core. Give me Abyss Rising, man. Abyss Rising. Yes. Release date, November 9th, 2012. Set type, core set. Major strategies, oh, Mermail, yes, Prophecy, dude, Adolce, Impact, two a new watery meta threat. Abyss Rising was the last core set and the last major set in general for 2012, bringing a second wave of support for various decks from Return of the Duelist premieres, God, while also yes. bringing its own new powerhouse archetype. That archetype was Mermail, a series of fish, aqua, and sea God, serpents yes. all centering around swarming the field in various ways. This initial wave brought us Abyss Lind, who when destroyed on the field summons a mermail from deck, Abyss Gund, who revives a mermail when discarded, Abyss Spike, able to discard a water monster to search a level 3 or lower water from deck, Abyss Megalo, a level 7 that can discard two water monsters Megalo's to summon so itself good, from man. hand, adding an Abyss spell or trap from deck to hand when summoned this way, and able to tribute a water monster once per turn to make itself able to attack twice, Abyss Gaios, a waterlocked rank 7 that locks level 5 and higher from attacking and can detach a material to negate the effects of all monsters your opponent controls with less attack than himself, and Abyss Sphere, which summons a mermail from deck on activation, negating its effects on field, locking spell cards, and destroying itself in the opponent's next end phase. Mermail from here would see an explosive start into the meta, which we'll talk about with the next YCS. Prophecy and Spellbook will receive a solid follow-up wave here in Justice, who can banish herself in the end phase if you activated a Spellbook that turn to search for a level 5 or higher, light or dark spellcaster, and a Spellbook from deck to hand. Eternity, which adds a banished Spellbook back to hand. Fate, which could banish up to three Spellbooks in Grave to trigger one of its Fate effects, so strong. with the most common being the banished three for a non-targeting banish. Grand Spellbook Tower, a field Abyss spell Rising that can stack a spellbook great, yeah. from Grave on bottom of the deck to draw one in your standby phase. But I believe it gets better after cap. the next ban list, because like the next ban list I think takes out Windup and then it's just like Mermail and Spellbook and all that. It's pretty basic. Master from deck with level equal to or lower than your spellbooks in Grave when destroyed. And Star Hall, a TCG exclusive that gained a spell counter every time a spellbook is activated, boosting all spellcasters by 100 for each, and adds a spellcaster from deck to hand with a level less than or equal to the counters it had when it was destroyed by a card effect. Spellbooks once again would not quite be meta from this, but if the direction they were going kept up, it wouldn't be long until the resource engine breaks into the meta, especially with the power of Fate's non-targeting banish effect. Madolce would see a powerful second wave too in Messengelato, who is able to search a Madolce spell or trap when special summoned while you control a beast type Madolce monster, Queen Tiramisu, a Madolce locked rank 4 that can detach a We're material to target Cosmo up to Blazer, two Madolce right? cards uh, in Grave, shuffling them back so into deck water, to spin away that many cards the opponent controls, not targeting for the spin back. 
ticket, which adds a Madolce monster from deck to hand if you return a Madolce from field or grave to hand or deck, able to special summon the card instead if you control a fairy type Madolce, and Madolce Palooza, uh, no, had able to summon any number of Madolce monsters from hand, shuffling them into deck at the end phase. This wave would be powerful enough to let Madolce see the occasional rogue level success, but something was still missing for the deck to be consistently powerful, as its swarm potential was extremely minimal with the best option there being Mufile. As for the one-offs, Planet Pathfinder could tribute itself to search for a field spell, That's which while Planet not powerful Pathfinder now would be revisited really? in the future once field spells became more vital. When, when, Solar Windjammer was a level 5 that could be special summoned if you control no monsters, raising its level each turn, being considerable for decks needing a level 5 flood option going first. Mullen Glacio, the Elemental Lord, was a counterpart to Granol from the last set, just for waters instead of earths, and ripped two cards from the opponent's hand on summon, seeing play for the newly popular Mermails as a boss. Gaga Ga Cowboy was a rank 4 that gained a different effect based Mullen on Glacia's what battle position it was in, then. gaining a thousand attack and dropping its attack target by 500 that turn when in attack position, or dealing 800 burn in defense position, which became such a common effect that the term cowboy for game became a regular occurrence, <laughs> with players commonly burning their opponent for the last 800 needed to win a game. Forbidden Dress would be another alternative to Lance and Chalice, able to drop a monster's attack by 600 to prevent targeting and effect destruction that turn, seeing occasional play for specific decks in the near future. Abyss Dweller was a new oh, TCG no, exclusive man. rank 4 that boosted all water monsters by 500 while it had a no. water material, and could detach one to prevent Not any grave Abyss effect Dweller. activations from the opponent that turn, seeing immediate extra deck staple play as a counter to various strategies. Lastly, Bahamut Shark was an OCG oh, import waterlocked rank 4 that could summon a rank 3 or lower water exceed from the extra deck, losing its attack the turn it was activated, seeing play for specific exceed summons later in this era and into the next. YCS Seattle Tacoma was held just 9 days later, and immediately we'd see Mermail, Mermail. make an impact on the meta, taking 7 of the top 32. Calling the deck solely Mermail does feel like a bit of an injustice, as it's technically 3 major archetypes all smashed together. Being Mer was that the difference between Bestial Runic and Sprite for High Runic? I think Bestial has more non-engine against decks where Bestials are good. Like whereas for Higher, it just doesn't have room for non-engine whatsoever. So it's like not as good against uh, Unchained and stuff like that. But yeah. Mail, Atlantean, and Gen X. Weirdly enough. As the Atlanteans all trigger when sent to grave to use a water monster's effect, they naturally synergize well with the Mermails. Doesn't the next course have constantly... the Dragon Rulers? No, Dragon Rulers are like middle of 2013. I don't think... Uh, I, I, there was quite a while where we had a Mermail metagame. I remember at German Nationals 2013, it was still Mermail, uh, which must have been like May 2013. I think it's like May or June where we get the Dragon Rulers because they came out... Specifically in 2013, the Dragon Rulers came out between German Nationals and Euros. Because at German Nationals, it was still Mermail. And then at Euros, it was um, Dragon Rulers. So somewhere, it must have been May, June, or July. Sending waters to grave for cost, triggering the searches and pops but from we the get Atlantean Cosmo side Blazer of the deck. First with In a similar Fist. vein, Gen X Undyne is notably useful as it sends a water from deck to grave for cost to search for Gen X controller, meaning you have a normal summon that can pitch any Atlantean from deck for its effect. Yeah, yeah. In addition to this, Abyss Sphere specifically holds a lot of power by summoning out Abyss Lind, who gets her summon from deck effect when popped by Sphere leaving the field, giving the deck so many ways into Abyss Megalo. On top of all of this, Molen Glacia is just another powerful body to add to the pile of insane this power the deck can wonderful. put out. Actually, but shockingly, no, this deck was not wonderful yet. I mean, this deck, I this deck, I loved Mermail, but the when I really love Mermail is when uh, I believe it was I think Billy Brake or Jeff Jones. I don't remember who it was, but when they invented Mono Mermail, the one where you played Abyss Tius, because at this point you don't play Abyss Tius yet. Um. After Mono Mermail, I was in love, man. That Mermail was would so only cool. get second place here. First place would be instead taken by Michael Stibbins on Insector, playing the more refined version of the combo variant here, and notably playing Triple Threatening Roar in the main to buy a turn for Card Card D to do its thing. YCS Barcelona would be the last event of the year. This is the first one I played uh, y um, Mermails at. I... <laughs> This was also the first time I picked my deck on the Friday, by the way, because I, I, I distinctly remember on the Friday deciding to play Mermail, and then I had to pick up three of the structure decks, 
at the vendors because I didn't have the cards and I had to buy three Spanish mermail stru uh, Atlantean structure decks and I still I owned I played those Spanish Atlanteans for so long I remember that very very um, fondly three weeks later and while we don't know much about this event we do know that a newer variant my of spanish an old uh, would marksman take the day. infantry that being and jack brune's macro rabbit a variant on the previous this was Dino also rabbit. this was a pretty nice event because jack brune had been so close to winning a ycs for so so long and then that day he finally got it it, it was pretty it was pretty nice it with the power of macro cosmos slotted in which counters all of these primary threats in the meta while not stopping your own cards which would lead to the deck's popularity how old were you at that point uh i was 17 i think yes 17 going from here lastly for the year the Yu-Gi-Oh! zexel manga volume 2 promo would drop two days after barcelona wait i topped being... i topped barcelona with 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 mermail but i lost in top 32 to chaos dragons i think Number 50, Black Ship of Corn, able to detach a material to send an opponent's weaker monster to grave and burn them for a thousand, which would see the occasional tech slot in various rank 4 strategies. And with that, 2012 would come to a Oof. close, bringing the Zexal era into a full steam ahead mode I mean, as newer and more year, powerful man. exceed strategies continue to pop up and grow. That was, that was like my... I, I remember a lot of this stuff very, very fondly because it was the first time, like, it was the first year where I would, like, travel to big events and stuff like that, which is why I I have a lot of, uh, like, competitive memories of this of this year. Like, before, before 2012, I used to play a lot of, like, German events, you know, I'd go to, like, regionals and all that kind of stuff, but, like, the 2012 was the year I started traveling, the year I really got into, um, into like big competitive tournaments uh, a lot and uh, it was yeah it was, uh, looking back honestly a lot of cool stuff happened some troll despair with the rabbit you know we don't talk about the rabbit these days but overall you know pretty damn cool okay once again uh shout outs to the law ygo for providing these amazing recaps uh can't wait for 2013 the link to the video is in chat once again give uh, give the law ygo some love subscribe to their channel watch their other videos if you haven't seen them yet